glad to see you, or actually I can't see you, but you can see me, so I guess I should say, so glad to be seen. And you say, wait, that this isn't what I'm used to seeing. Yes, Cody has been uh, working so hard this week, and uh, he's created a streaming studio so that we can hopefully uh, do a better experience for uh, watching, because uh, this will give us some more options and, and make it better for us to be able to talk with you. Uh, since we're having to do it this way. Uh, I will tell you right now, and I, I confessed to Cody a few minutes ago as we were getting ready, I'm a little nervous. And it's, I mean, obviously, you've been watching me record videos. I've been going live, and we've been streaming for a while. But it's it's another different thing, and it's a different way to do this. And and it's been it's been an intense week. And I know that that is true of all of us, that it's been a, it's been a crazy week. And we're living in just times that, you know, we've no, nobody's ever faced this in our lifetimes, in the lifetimes of, of no matter how old we are. Uh, and so there's so much uncertainty. So I am excited to be able to at least have us together this way. And, and we already know by watching that there's many of you that are joining us on the live stream this morning. I know there are others of you who will be watching this, and uh, it's not live anymore. But you are still meeting with us. The Spirit of God is not constrained by time and by a clock. And so even even over the times uh, that you might be watching this, you are still gathering with us in spirit. And Paul made that clear as he wrote letters that maybe were read months later. And he said, yet we are together in spirit. So I'm going to open with a word of prayer, and uh, then we're going to sing a song together. I hope that you uh, maybe had a chance to look at our YouTube uh, video that we posted this morning with some of the some worship karaoke and some really uh, wonderful offerings there. But let's pray. <coughs> Good morning, Father. Lord, I just thank you so much that we live in a time that as we face an age-old problem of, of sickness and pestilence and, and pandemic, that yet in this time, because of technology, it allows us to find ways to connect find ways for us to be uh, with each other, even though we aren't together in person. Lord, just uh, I thank you for the team here at Dean's Corner, for Cody, for Beth, for Rick, for Brenda, for uh, Bill, for all those who are uh, working so hard to keep the church functioning in new ways. And Lord, as we gather around uh, the internet this morning, as we come together, Lord, just center our hearts on you. Center my heart on you and on your word and what we're going to share this morning. And may it encourage us, may it remind us of where our hearts and minds need to be most of the time in the midst of so much going on. So be with this time, this way, this morning. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Cody's going to come, and we're going to sing a song. This is new for us, too. <clears throat> and this song's a little high, so forgive me. Usually I've got other singers helping me out here. <clears throat> Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, 
Lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart. Come as you are, come as you are. joy for the morning O oh, sinner be still earth has no sorrow that heaven can't kill earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your burdens lay down your shame all who are broken Amen. I hope that you sang along and I hope that you can see the words. This is something, again, new we're trying. And uh, so now, hey, kids, kids gather around the screen. We're going to actually go on a little bit of a field trip right now. And so we go live, well, sort of live, uh, outside. So come with me. Good morning, kids. How are you? Boy, I wish I could see you right now. I wish that we could be together and all hang out at church. I'm not even at church. You can tell, right? You look. I'm home. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you uh, from my house, and I want to show you something. So come with me, and we're going to come back, back here, back in my, back to behind my house. I want to show you something. Okay, I want to show you something. All right, I got a rock back here. Do you see that giant rock? It's a big rock. Want to climb up it? Let's climb up it. So here you can see the big rock. Up we go. up high so way up here now on top of the rock now want to try to move it <laughs> do you think we can move a rock this big do you think I can move it All right, if I jump up and down do you think I can move it I don't think so <laughs> do you think if I push real hard I can move it no no well, maybe if you all came to my house, maybe we could all move it together. <laughs> no, that's silly. 
But you know, there are other things that aren't quite as big that maybe if we work together, we could all move. In fact, I've got a bunch of wood right here in a big wood pile. And you know what? That's a lot of wood. And a bunch of people work together. It was too much for just me to do all by myself. And so a bunch of people helped. Because there's a lot of jobs that are too big. Do you ever have, a, have to ask for help and say, you know, ask mom or dad or, or your grandparents or so I say, can you help me with this? It's too heavy. It's too big. And you need help. You know what the Bible says, what we're going to talk to the grown-ups today about, is the Bible says that there's a lot of times when we need to reach out for help. And that's why we have a church, and that's why we are the church. It's, it's to come together and help each other. Because sometimes, man, sometimes things are big. Right now, you know, you say, well, I don't have school, and, and I'm, you know, we're stuck at home, and there's things that we can't do right now. Can't go hang out with all my friends, and it's really hard, and maybe it's scary. Maybe, maybe it's scary for your folks, too. And yeah, because the world is scary, and sometimes the world is too big. And it's hard to do by ourselves. And so that's why we have each other. To care for each other, to help each other, to, to be strong for each other and, and, and help out each other. And that's why we have what we call church. Church isn't just something we do on a Sunday right now where we have to do it on the, on the computer, on the TV. But church is who we are. It's people helping out each other and looking out for each other and helping them when you feel weak, especially weak trusting Jesus. Because when things are scary, it's hard to trust Jesus. And I don't know if you ever get scared, but I do. And when I get scared, sometimes I have a hard time trusting Jesus. And so then I need my friends to help me and to encourage me. And the last two weeks without being able to all be together at the church building, sometimes it's made, made Pastor Iris scared made me a little sad. And that's when I need other people to help me. And that's why we have each other. And Jesus gave us each other to help us when we're scared, when we feel maybe all weak inside. So I love you. I'm praying for you. I miss you. And I hope you're doing good. If you want to send me little videos to say hi or send me a message, I'd love to hear from you. And I hope that you are taking good care of the people that you live with. And I hope that each day you talk to Jesus and know that all the time he will take care of us. So I hope you have a great day and thanks for doing children's message with me. I love you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, I hope that was fun. So we have been seeing some of your feedback so far this morning and know that you seem to be uh, having some audio issues. We don't know why, because uh, here in the studio, our, our audio is fine. Uh, but we are seeing that. So hopefully we're going to try to boost that. And hopefully for the rest of this morning, you can see it better. Uh, and so, he, so you can see your audio. And hopefully you can hear our picture well, too. <laughs> so I'll try to get a little closer to the mic. And this is an ongoing experiment for us, just so you know. So we are in Life in Troubled Times. Part 7, this is our final one of this series, and then next week is Palm Sunday. And uh, obviously, we're not going to be having the Palm Sunday and Easter that we anticipated. Uh, it's pretty clear that we won't be able to be together. Uh, we are working on some ideas to make it very, very special, uh, because Easter is special no matter what, uh, because of celebrating the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So there will still be Good Friday service, there will still be Easter service. Uh, we'll find ways to do it here online, and uh, I'm hoping for some special things, so keep posted on that. Uh, what's interesting as we wrap up this series this morning is that this series I put together, and some of you already know this, I put together this series in January before I left for the Dominican Republic when we had no idea you know, what we'd be facing. I mean, yes, we'd heard about the, the virus in China, but uh, even then it, it wasn't uh, we didn't realize we were about to uh, be hit with the most troubled times of our lives. and uh, But God knew, and that's why God picked this out. And as I've been looking over the notes, because I've, uh, year, weeks ago, not years, weeks ago, I worked up the notes for uh, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter, and after. 
And as I look at those notes that were done before we had any idea that we would even be taking a short break, much less than a long break of getting together in person, uh, you can see what the Holy Spirit had in mind. But anyway, let's get into this morning. And uh, so just a quick review of where we've been. The book of James, of course, we're listening to the pastor of the Jerusalem church talk to churches throughout the Roman Empire who are busy struggling with Uh, times of revolution. There's economic and um, political upheaval. There's a lot of economic inequality. People are upset. And revolution is percolating through the empire. And that revolution is, of course, infecting and affecting the church because the church is made up of people in our culture. We are creatures of our own culture. And so James is trying to teach and help the church understand how God's people have to be different, how God's people are are set apart and different than those who are in the world. And so one of the things that he talked about is that anger is not used by God to achieve righteousness. It says the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And that's a big one because so often we feel so empowered by anger, and then we, in anger we want to get stuff done, and we oftentimes try to justify our anger because our anger is justifiable, we therefore we call it righteous anger, and we try to say that we've got the anger of God. And yet James had said the anger of man does not achieve what God's trying to achieve. And so we have to remember that. And then he also told us to consider trials as joy, because these are good gifts from God, that even though bad things are happening on the earth, God has allowed them into our lives to do good things, and that when we need to ask God for things, we need to not be doubting what he's doing. And it doesn't mean you can never ask for it to be over. I pray like crazy that this would end. But knowing that it may not end and knowing that that may not be God's plan, I also say, Lord, <clears throat> how do you want to use me? How do you want to use my family? How do you want to use the church? Because you have allowed this, and I know that you are good and not doubting his goodness. And then one of the things James suggested was you need to love those who are less fortunate, and you need to love them with actions. He said just talking really is useless, and that your faith is demonstrated not by what you say you believe, but by your actual actions and and the words you speak, but not when you say all the right things. But how do you talk when you're under stress? There you will see whether your faith is real. So so that's where we've been. And so now we're going to finish the book of James today, and, and hear his kind of final thoughts as he brings all this together. And it's especially going to be important because, as we've been noting all the way through here, is that when we, James has so much good stuff that we oftentimes have pulled parts of James out. And when we pull parts of James out, we read him out of context, and then we end up missing his point. And then we actually say things that, oh, James says this, when he didn't say that. And we've noticed that several times, and if you missed those, you can go back, and all those sermons are, are online on our, uh, here on our Facebook page or on our, um, on our website. But we're going to see, especially today, a, a passage that's oftentimes been misunderstood. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Good morning again, Father, and Lord, as we, as we are together around your word this morning, as we're opening your word, may we read these words that you preserved for us from James, as you wanted James not just to speak to the churches of his time, but to us in our time. And Lord, we know that these are your words that you spoke through James. So Lord, as we open your word, may we hear from you, and may we take them to heart, May we look into your word like we're looking into a mirror and have it tell us about ourselves and help us see what you want to do to change us and mold us. So be with our study now. Be with me. Give me clarity as I just share your word. May you be the one who speaks to us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's turn to James 5. And we're starting in verse 12 and going to go to the end of the chapter in the book. If you have uh, one of those Bibles that have headings, you'll notice that you have a heading between 12 and 13. Remember, those headings were not put in by James, and the chapter numbers and the verse numbers <coughs> excuse me, were not put in by James, so don't get hung up on those. The paragraph 
first begins in 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So let's unpack that. And you can see there's, especially in this time we're living in right now, some verses that sound interesting. So in verse 12, first he says, do not swear oaths. And this one trips a lot of people up. So what does he mean? Does this mean that, you know, when you go into court, you shouldn't put your hand on the Bible and swear and stuff like that? But we, this is where you have to remember the context. Because we want to say, oh, well, see, he's just talking about swearing oaths as far as uh, making false promises. And it, it could mean that, and that wouldn't be inconsistent with, with other things that God has taught. But in the context, he's talking again about in a revolutionary context in the things that were going on with upheaval. And so, you know, and he's talked about the, the hot rhetoric and, and the control of the tongue. And so think about when we when when you are ready to swear an oath because you're upset and trying to do something about it. And so, you know, as God is my witness, I will do this. Or, so help me God. And a lot of times, the, the old oaths of that time maybe, you know, and even now, if may God strike me down if I don't by tomorrow do this. Or if you're, you know, small children, cross my heart and hope to die. But the idea being that you are swearing these oaths and, and calling down God on your, your efforts to do all this vengeance. And he says, instead, just speak plainly. Let your yes be yes and your no be be no and just speak plainly and don't don't drag God into your things here let your yes be yes and your no be no instead what does he say he said actually you should be doing something different than that he says instead you should be patient right he had said in in verses in the previous verses he said be patient and so this is talking about impatience and swearing oaths and then verse 13, he says, instead, you should be praying. Instead of swearing oaths, you should be praying. And then as we get into 13 and then 14, because they're suffering, what are they suffering? They're suffering injustice and economic disparity. And so if you're suffering, instead of swearing oaths, pray. That's the context. If you're cheerful, sing. But then he gets talking about being sick, and this is where we really get in, because we're in a time now when sickness is such a scary thing with getting this coronavirus. And these verses have been troubled over because some of what it says here sounds like, well, just do this and you'll be all better, and we know that's not how it works. We know that sometimes we pray over people and we might, you know, bring in elders, anoint with oil, and it doesn't always result. Is that what these verses are saying? Well, we need to take a couple minutes to look at this. The word here that is translated sick literally means weakness. This is not referring to your physical health. 
And bear with me, because if already you're like, hey, 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 now hang on a minute. I've understood that that way for a long time, and I've heard others talk about it. Well, this is not my opinion. Let's look at what the context tells us, because the Bible tells us how to understand it. And sometimes we tell the Bible how to understand it, and that's not how it works. So the word here, sick, means weakness. And it, can it refer to physical weakness? Well, it could. Does it here? Well, no, it's referring to faith, not health. And so we have to take a couple minutes to look at other uses of this word. Because in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word that here is translated sick does mean physical weakness. However, in all the other books, the Acts and all the letters, this word is not used that way. This word is used for spiritual. And let's look at some of those. So the first one is in Acts 20, 35. So let's turn there real quick. Acts 20, 35. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Romans 6.19. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Here he is talking about their trouble obeying because of the weakness of their flesh. But it doesn't mean their human frailty as far as health. He means their human frailty as far as being able to do the right thing because of sinful flesh. Romans 14, 1. <clears throat> now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. So there, that's the exact same word that James is using, and here it is translated weak in faith. And the last one is 1 Corinthians 8. <clears throat> First Corinthians 8, 9 through 12. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So there the word is used again and again. Every time it's not talking about that they're... Their stomachs can't handle meat. Their consciences can't. They are weak in faith. So we see that this word, these are the times it's used in the epistles, and every time it's referring not to physical sickness, but to spiritual weakness. All right? So that's the first point in showing that this is not talking about physical weakness. Now, in verse 15, it used a different word. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. So that's a different word, the one who is sick, or the sick one, or the weak one. All right? So the one who is sick. So we need to look at Hebrews, because this word is only used one other time in the New Testament, and it's used in Hebrews 12, too. Fixing, on, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. I'm, am I in the right chapter? Yep. I think I have the wrong verse. Whoops. Anyway, it's the one who is weak. I think it might be verse 3 there. Or maybe it's... No, I'm sorry, it's verse 12. That's my problem. Verse 12. Apologize. It's verse 12. <laughs> 
Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And that, you say, well, that sounds like it's talking about physically, but it's not, because he's talking about your spiritual walk, so your inability to walk or serve, okay, is what he's talking about. That's the context. So strengthen the hands that are weak, the one who is weak. It's talking about weak spiritually. We see the same phraseology as this in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Because it says, if you're weak, call the elders. Well, has he ever said that? Have have the apostles said that before? Well, Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we urge you, brethren, to admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And so here the elders are supposed to come and encourage and take care of people who are spiritually weak weak. So he says, if you're, if you're struggling and weak, pray. If you need help, call the leaders of the church to come help strengthen you. And as they pray for you, they will strengthen you so that you are, your, your faith will be strengthened and you'll be okay. And that fits very clearly with what our experience can be. Because we may not always experience, I have prayed over sick people, me and the elders have gathered around before someone who was sick, prayed for them, even anointed with oil, and they still died. Did God not keep his word? He was talking about spiritual strengthening in in troubled times. I would rather have it just be, hey, anyone who wants to get healed can get healed, but we know that's not how it works. Now, I'm still not done making my point. Uh, James is not done making his, because then in verse 16, notice that, so then he really pulls this together, because he says, therefore, he's been talking about this sick, which is spiritual weakness, and so then he pulls the whole argument together and says, therefore, confess your sins. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed spiritually. He's giving a spiritual solution to a spiritual problem. He says, therefore, you need to confess your sins. And again, it's easy for us. Sometimes we say, well, I am sick or I am going through a hard thing because I've sinned. And we sound just like the disciples with the man born blind. When they say, oh, why is he blind, Jesus? Is it because he sinned or because his parents sinned? Jesus says, no, that's not, not how it works. Sin can be the, sickness can be the result of sin. But it's because we live in a sinful world. But we are so quick to want to just equate the two. But God is way more concerned with your spiritual health. Way more concerned. And that's what James is dealing with here because he's dealing with As they're going through hard times, it's infecting their souls. And God is trying to heal that. Therefore, confess your sins. And then he illustrates it with Elijah. And he shows how powerful prayer can be. But it's talking about restoring people who are struggling. And we know from church history that many struggled. And when the tough times came, sometimes people... Abandon the faith. It was hard. It required tremendous strength to stand up during troubled times and still trust. Anyone can trust God when things aren't going wrong. But when things are hard and scary, that's when you'll find out whether you really trust him or not. And a lot of people have bailed out at that time. And that is where then we get the last two verses, 19 and 20. Because then he talks about those who don't reach out for help. My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he's restored a sinner. And so here he's now saying, and for those who, you know, first it was, so if you're struggling spiritually, call for help. And then it becomes, and if there's someone who is struggling spiritually who isn't calling for help because they are, they're straying and you're able to bring them back, that's a good thing. Okay, so let's apply this. As we just said, 
troubled times reveal spiritual weakness. As I have mentioned other times, I can be nice to anyone for a little while. I can walk into church Sunday morning and I can be nice to anyone. But what happens when you're stressed out? What happens when you're scared? What happens when you're sick? I get selfish. I get selfish quick. And my flesh becomes much more dominant. And my faith suddenly is much weaker. The faith to stand up for God in troubled times requires great strength of faith. To be able to stand in the arena as the lion comes. To, to be tied to the stake and all you have to do is renounce and you get to go free. Or as simple as not worrying about whether you're the one that gets the last roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Troubled times reveal our spiritual weakness. Anger impatience, coveting. And that has been true of me the last couple of weeks, and fear. And these are not all sins, but then they can be sins. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is why if you look at the text, he says, if you're, if you're weak, Call the elders, pray together. The Lord will raise him back up, restoring him to spiritual health. And if he's committed sins. So if I'm struggling, <clears throat> if I'm struggling with anger or with fear or with coveting or with impatience, and I'm not, I'm, I'm in trouble. So I called to the elders. I called to other Christian leaders to help me. And they come and pray for me to help get me on my feet spiritually, and if in the middle of that struggle I have committed sins because of the anger, the fear, the coveting, I can deal with those too. Because the presence of anger and the presence of fear are not sins, but they lead to them. And so James is giving a beautiful solution of deal with the weakness and deal with any consequences of that weakness through prayer praying for each other and confessing sins to each other because that's what we need. And, of course, we know the truth is that the worse it gets, the worse it gets. We're in a time now where people already, you know, there's, there's a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of blame. You know, let's figure out which politician is to blame. Let's, let's tear each other apart. Let's get mad at the people who are hoarding. Let's get mad at the people who aren't self-isolating because it's maddening. And when we and, and the more we feel under threat, the angrier we can get. And the more scared we are, the angrier and the the more the grace and love and mercy of Jesus is not going to show up in you. Because your faith is going to be eclipsed by your flesh, and that's what James is speaking to. And perhaps more than ever, maybe we can begin to understand what James is saying and why he's saying it. Because it may get worse. Here in Maine, we haven't been faced with what New York or Italy has been faced with yet. But what if it comes? What if it gets bad? Will we get bad? Will we become sinful, arrogant, angry, and consumed with fear? Spiritual weakness needs help. This is James' point. We need to confess our sin to one another. We need to seek out leaders for support in prayer. And we need to encourage each other. Doing that when we can't drop by each other's houses is harder, but it is not impossible. That's why we have phones. That's why we have video chatting. And even to the point now where I'm hoping that maybe as it gets warmer, I can meet with people one-on-one -on -one in driveways where we can stay six, eight, ten feet apart, but maybe sit in two lawn chairs and just talk. Because we must have each other. We must care for each other. And as we are social distancing 
as in keeping ourselves physically distant, we need to be the church, and we need to be together because we cannot do this alone, and we were never intended to. We need to care for each other. We need to confess our sins to each other. I've needed to confess to my wife and my wife to me. Fear. Because it's scary. And we need to be able to talk to each other about our weaknesses. Because James is saying that's how you deal with weaknesses. You talk to each other about it and you help each other. And we have a shepherding team. And if you're watching this and you're part of that shepherding team, we need you. And it's hard when you're dealing with your own stuff to deal with others too. But that's why leadership is hard. It's a greater responsibility and a greater privilege. And if you're, if you're just someone who needs help, reach out for help. And we need to help each other. And even if you're not an official leader, if you have a measure of spiritual strength, you need to help others, and especially spiritually. We need to help people physically, too, and James has already covered that. But the most important thing is we encourage each other. We are apart, but we must not be separate. We must connect. And I know many of you are, and I'm so thankful for that, and, and we'll never do it enough, but we got to just keep working at it. And that's why we're doing this, and that's why we'll have Bible studies, and we're setting up Zoom, because Zoom will allow us to see each other's faces and continue to be in each other's lives because we need each other. We are the church. And in these trying times, your anger, your fear, your weakness needs help. And James said that's what we're here for, to take care of one another. We need each other because we're the church. Let's pray. Father, hard times are hard, and it's hard to deal with these things. And Lord, sometimes we have run to you because we thought you were going to make everything all better. And you will make everything all better, but you didn't promise to make everything all better here and now. You told us in this world we would have trouble, but you gave us your peace. Lord, now we're really having to put that to the test. And we find that trusting you is hard during hard times. Thank you for James to remind us that we can't do it alone. That we need to reach out to each other that we need to confess our weaknesses and our sins to each other, not be afraid of what somebody's going to think. And Lord, you know my own heart that I have struggled this week with fear. Lord, let us not waver in our trust when we are afraid. But when we are afraid, we will trust in you. When we are angry, we will trust in you. And we will move our eyes off of our issues and off of the, the scariness and the sinfulness and the corruption of this world and focus on you. And pray for each other, to look out for each other, spiritually especially, and to not neglect our own weakness spiritually, but to reach out for help when we are spiritually weak and not to allow pride to cause us to go under spiritually because we didn't want to bother anyone. But let us be the church. Even when we have to do it digitally or over the phone, let us be the church. Thank you, Father, for taking such good care of us in such a sinful world. Be with us as we continue to navigate this time. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to close with a song. I hope you'll sing along with me. This song was picked out weeks and weeks ago, again, before we knew we wouldn't be singing it in the auditorium together. But as I was reflecting on these words as I drove over here to church this morning, to the church building, I thought that these words, especially this phrase here that we're going to sing, we pray that all unity may one day be restored because part of that unity now that I'm praying for is not just the unity of spirit, but the unity of physically being together. 
But join me, and let's sing this. And if you always have been self-conscious about your singing, now the people who know you best, they already know you can't sing. So just sing out loud. Make a joyful noise. Let's sing this together. <clears throat> We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you for joining us for this. I hope that these words from James, from God, have spoken to you as they have spoken to me. If you're able, love to have you meet, join us at 3 for our 3 o'clock study. We will be posting a Zoom link if you want to get on in Zoom so that we can actually communicate. Uh, but we will be streaming it here on our Facebook page as well. I love you. I miss you. And together, we will keep our hope in the Lord. Have a good day.